message is entitled, The Sin and the Law. And you know, when it comes to the law, a lot of us don't really want to hear much about that. And sometimes we want to see it and reveal it from our own perspective. And as today was daylight savings time, and I know how many of you enjoy it as much as I do, I was kind of thinking about the old Indian saying, and whether it's true or not, I don't know, but if it isn't, it should be. But a white man was trying to explain to an old Indian in the old days about the concept of daylight savings time. And as the Indian was listening to the explanation, he was sitting there shaking his head and going, only a white man would cut off a foot of a blanket and sew it to the top and think that he made the blanket longer. <laughs> what that Indian understood was there are only so many minutes of daylight. And whether your clock agrees with the daylight or not, it's still the same time. And I think perhaps that's the way we see law sometimes, or we don't see the law. We want to take and to change the law to fit us. And I think sometimes we would like to take and make some of the law ambiguous. We would like to say, well, that law means this, but it doesn't mean that. It kind of reminds me of a little boy who one night went in and his mom was preparing for supper. And he says, well, mom, can I help you set for supper? And the mom says, well, no, but thank you for asking. And the little boy grins and says, well, thank you for saying no. <laughs> you see, that little boy wasn't all that inspired to go the extra step of helping for supper. He knew he should, but it wasn't really in his heart. He was desiring one thing, and unfortunately, his heart really wasn't in it. And when it comes to sin and the law, we can still be that way today. The fact, if you really truthfully are honest with ourselves, man has been trying to rewrite God's laws for 6,000 years. From Adam and Eve, through all generations since, we have been a people who desire to change what God has said to fit us. And a guy that understood that concept probably better than most was a man named Paul who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament and I will honestly tell you that reading Paul is hard listening to Paul being read is even harder because he has a poetic style and so occasionally if you just start reading Paul nonstop it gets lost so I'm gonna chop up today's scripture a little bit and I'm gonna start in Romans 7 verses 7 through 12 and it will say then, what shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had told me, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved death to me. For sin seized an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. Now, Paul is pointing out a very clear fact. You cannot know what the law says unless you know the law. There is an old saying in law enforcement that ignorance of the law is no excuse. And you will find that if you say, I was speeding and, well, I didn't know it was a speed zone. Well, you should have because you have a responsibility as a driver. And much the same way, God has built into his people a natural knowledge of right and wrong. And today, it's politically incorrect to say that there are some things that are right and there are some things that are wrong. It is much more happy today to say, well, your truth is good, my truth is good, and those truths may not agree, but we're all okay. It's all going to be good. 
The problem with that is two opposing truths cannot be true. If two opposing truths happen, it's because one of them is false and one of them is true. Now, if a Christian looks at the law and it says this is wrong, no matter how much I rationalize it, no matter how much I try to acknowledge that I just think it's not that bad, it is. And the desire to make it something other than it is comes from Satan. And Paul kind of looks at that dilemma and he understands our feelings because if that's anything like me today, you're looking at that and going, um, not exactly what I wanted to hear today. Not exactly the words I was hoping for today. And he continues in verse 13. So did that which is good bring death to me? By no means. It was the sin produced death in me through the what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment may become sinful beyond measure. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So no, now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, I keep on doing. Now I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. I hate that verse, or those verses. Because it makes me acknowledge something that I would prefer not to acknowledge. Verse 18 says, For I know nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. You know, the days of good self-esteem, that kind of verse just seems to fly in the face and say, well, that's not going to make you feel very good. Well, I'm here to tell you, it shouldn't. The fact that I am a sinful person at my nature should not make me feel good. It should convict me. It should tell me I need something different. There's something that is wrong that needs to be changed. And what Paul is trying to tell us very clearly is that on my own, I will fail. On my own, I will not pass go. God will not accept me. I must confess that I am flawed and failed. While that is so uncomfortable, it is also necessary. Because if I can give out myself some hope, some degree of saying, well, I'm good. Oh yeah, I have a few sins, but I'm not as bad as the other guy over the stress, the street. You know, I, I'm not that bad, so I'm a little better than they are. There's a fallacy in that. And Jesus pointed it out to his disciples one day when a Pharisee was doing exactly that in a temple. Where a Pharisee was looking at a tax collector who said, man, I'm so glad I'm not like that man. And the tax collector beat his breast and said, oh Lord, forgive me, I am a sinner. Jesus' words was, the tax collector went today forgiven. The Pharisee went home unforgiven. I have to acknowledge my failure. I have to acknowledge that I do not meet the standards that God set up for me. And how do I know that? Because the law tells me I have failed, that I am flawed. And so in a lot of ways, I could resent the law. I really do occasionally find myself wanting to resent the law. I joke about that speed limit sign out there that I tend to want to ignore occasionally. It was put there for my safety and for my well-being and for the safety and well-being of others. But when the police officer with those bright, pretty lights 
pulls up behind me and tells me that I've just violated that speed limit, I hate the law. I really do. Not because the law is unjust, but because I have just been caught breaking the law and there will be consequences. That's what the law is designed to do, to point out to me the failure of my life, the flaws that I have dealt with, and the flaws that I'm trying to operate under. So it is difficult to look at the law with a positive attitude. But Paul, he's going to work at it for us. In verse 21 it says, So I find to be the law that when I do want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ the Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There's a fallacy that gets into the church, and it's a fallacy that we as a church need to address and make sure it doesn't continue or exist in our own church. And that is that somehow because I am a Christian, I am okay. I have come to a point of grace, and God has accepted me right where I'm at because, hey, I have been a member of XYZ's church for XYZ years, and I've done this and I've done that. Paul says, you know what? Part of me wants to do good. But there's another part of me that wants to do terrible, rotten things. And they're both part of me. And if I don't acknowledge both, I won't address the need I have for salvation. We spend way too much time today rationalizing our sin. We explain how we can't help it. And that it's somebody else's fault rather than my own fault. We want to take all of our responsibility and put it on something else other than ourselves. And if I do that, I will find myself lost. One of the requirements of the law that Paul makes very clear is, I have to acknowledge I'm wrong. I have failed. I am flawed. I need to be saved. And you know that dilemma within us that seems to strive within each and every one of us seems to be depressing. I want to do good things, but instead I find myself doing bad things. I want to think good thoughts, but instead I find myself hating and angry and doing bad things and thinking bad thoughts. And that's a really terrible place to be. And Paul acknowledges that because he says, who will save a wretch like me? And he ends it with, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that myself serves the law of my mind, but my flesh I serve the law of sin. Those two laws are going to conflict with you the rest of your life. I hate to tell you this, if you had some hopes that someday sin would just evaporate from you and that you'd wake up someday going, wow, I just don't feel like sinning today. Somehow the temptations just don't tempt me today. I somehow am going to be just really wonderful from here on out. I'd love to tell you that that's going to happen, but short of heaven, it is not. Every day you spend on this earth, you will be challenged by sin. You will be tempted by sin. You will be challenged to accept either the law of sin or the law of God. And I want to get so that when I see the sin coming, I, like Paul, say, I don't want that in my life. But the problem with the church today is that we tend to just disregard it, pretend it doesn't exist. Like the Pharisee, we want to pretend and compare ourselves to others and say, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but man, I'm still better than the guy next door. You know, that's, that guy, he's a real 
so-and-so, and and as long as I can be nicer and better than him, I think God will consider that as good. And the sad part of that analogy is, is that God doesn't consider either of you very good. Your actions, your sin nature separates you from God. And for pretending that it doesn't exist, pretending that there are somehow ranks in sin. You know, I love how when I've talked to Bible studies before, I'd say, you know, I am no better than Adolf Hitler. And some of the ladies will look at me like, wait a minute, Adolf Hitler was a despicable human being who murdered millions of people and you haven't murdered anyone. True enough. But the truth of the matter is, in my heart, I have been angry, I have held hatred, and Jesus says, if I've been angry with my brother, I have committed murder. I want to rank the sin of Adolf Hitler, and I want to say he's so much more despicable than me. But the law tells me both of you are condemned to hell because of what you've been and what you are. Both of you deserve hell because the law says that. To deny that truth is to take apart the salvation that Jesus Christ offers us. If I can somehow diminish my sin, if my sin can somehow be reduced by comparing it to another more evil person, then the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was not necessary. I diminish his death in trying to diminish my sin. And unfortunately, we today desire to do that. We want to diminish our sin. The other thing I find very, very, very common in the church today is I rationalize it. I can sin because I can't help it. I just can't help it. I can't tell you how many people that I have dealt with who told me that they were doing things wrong, but they couldn't help it. I find, as a police officer, I arrested people who said, well, I just can't help it. I, I can't change. It's just part of who I am. It's what I am. And nothing I can do. And I love it because so many people, and you know, it, we have a beautiful age group in this church, and I occasionally think of myself as old because I'm all 65 years old. And then you, I hear someone like that laugh, who goes, 65? You're a kid. But the truth of it is, all throughout my life, even in my 20s and 30s, I would hear people of that age group going, I'm too old to change. I can't change. I'm too old. I've been this way too long. Nothing can change in my life. Because I just, well, you know, it's been this way for too long. My friends, Jesus Christ is about changing the hearts and the lives of the people who follow him. You are never too old to change. You are never too old to see transformation. And I'm here to tell you that as much as you want to rationalize sin, and that's straight from Satan, there is no rationalizing sin. I have to accept sin as sin. When I say, well, I've been angry, but I didn't kill anybody like Adolf Hitler, I'm rationalizing because God looks at my anger and says, Rick, that is a sin. You can't hate people and be my child. You cannot take and judge people and be my child. I have to have that accountability that says, no, what I am doing was wrong. And I don't want to sit there and have somebody say, well, at least you're not as bad as so-and-so. No, I'm sorry, folks. In the law of God, I am just as bad. In fact, perhaps I'm even worse. I've shared with you about my father. My father was an alcoholic. He was a violent alcoholic. He put a gun to my head on a Christmas Eve and threatened to blow my head off. Needless to say, I grew up with a very bad 
attitude with him. I was very angry. I hated him. And for many years, that continued. And one of the things that God convicted me of finally was, was my father's actions sin? Absolutely. Without question. That is sin. But then, you know how we love to grade sin, and we want to say, well, is this sin worse than that sin? And God doesn't, you know, make no mistake, God does not grade sin. But one day on one of my days where I was trying to grade sin and make me a little better than them, God says, you know, for a Christian to hate his father is a much greater sin than the sin of the father being violent to the son. Because you've known forgiveness, and yet you're unwilling to give forgiveness. And that hurt badly. It struck to the very pinnacle of my heart. What I was doing was trying to rationalize how righteous I was in my anger and my hatred. And what is in fact true was I was a victim who was saved by God and who God delivered. And now I was being unwilling to see that same love extended to someone else. I cannot hold a double standard as a Christian when it comes to sin. I cannot diminish it. I cannot rationalize it. And unfortunately, I will never, ever be free of sin. I would love to tell you that I'm going to get better at it, and that by better I mean fighting it, not being better at getting sin. But the truth of it is, the rest of my life will be spent battling sin in my life and battling the attitudes that go with sin, the rationalization, the minimalization, the ideology that says, well, try to be better so you're at least better than those. You know, we cannot free ourselves from sin. And the idea today that we should somehow eliminate the law so that we will somehow feel better is the most dangerous thing I can think of today. When I have people who tell me that the Bible is not the Word of God, and my friends, that is preached in churches today by people with ordinations, there are people telling me the Bible is not the Word of God. My friends, that is an attempt to undo the law. There are people who will tell you that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God because without Jesus Christ dying on a cross, they think somehow they're going to find a way to circumvent forgiveness. They're going to circumvent and make it on their own. And as much as I would love to tell you that there is somehow you're going to do that, you can work their whole life being as good as you desire to be, and you will still go to hell without the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The law is there to show me where I have fallen. It is there to show me the failures of my ways. Like that speed limit sign, it is there to tell me what the law is. If I choose to disregard that speed limit sign, there is consequences. There will be problems. On the same token, because I know what the sign says, I can choose to say, you know what? It's time, and I do this quite frequently because I do have a, what's called a lead foot. If I don't set my cruise control, I will find myself driving much faster than I should. It seems impossible for me to drive the speed limit. It's perhaps because I spent way too many years exceeding the speed limit that it just doesn't seem right. So we definitely have to have a law that shows us the parameters. And God does that. He does it because he desires for us to understand that 
The sin that we are looking at is the sin that will destroy us unless we confess it and come free. There's a story about a guy named Ted who went to a football game and he didn't get there till almost the first quarter was all over. And uh, his friend says, what took you so long? And the guy says, well, I had to toss a coin to decide whether I was going to come to the game or come to church. And the guy says, well, how long did it take you to toss a quarter? Well, I had to toss the quarter 14 times. You see, like Ted, we want to kind of make the rules up as we go. We want the law to exclude our behavior. It, we want exclusions. We want to feel like, well, I'm not so bad. I mean, not as bad as so-and-so. But the truth of it is, part of the law is to say, I am just as bad. With Ted, he knew that where he should be, he just didn't want to go there. And if I'm honest, there's a part of me that doesn't want to follow God's law. Now that sounds terrible coming from a pulpit, doesn't it? But the truth of it is, there's not a single one of you that can't look at me and say, yeah, I know that feeling. Because I too don't really want to follow God's law. There's a part of me that wants to do the wrong thing. There's a part of me that really desires, like Adam and Eve, to eat the fruit. I always get people that love to blame Adam and Eve and says, you know, if they hadn't blown it in the garden, we'd be okay. And I laugh because I go, you think you and I would have done any better? We wouldn't have. We would have blown it just like they blew it. Because that's our nature. We talk about the law. And we desire to change it. And it can be depressing looking at the law and seeing how often I fail. And the fact that, like I said, I'm 65 years old. If I get blessed with another 40 years of life, which is unlikely, I will spend another 40 years of life battling sin. I would just really like to find a point where God says, no, you've done enough. No more sin in your life. You're not going to have to battle that problem anymore. But I don't find anywhere in Scripture that says that's not the case. In fact, what Paul says is, there's a part of me that desires to do God's will. There's also a part of me that desires to do sin. And those two are going to war with each other the entire point of my life. Now, I will tell you that with Jesus Christ, we must understand that that battle could be depressing. And in Paul's own words, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. What he's saying is, yes, you will battle sin. But there is salvation. There is hope. You can conquer sin, not on your own accord, not through your own strength, but through Jesus Christ and his willingness and love to forgive you. Now, there are people today that will tell you that that's a very narrow-minded view and that you somehow should be more inclusive, that you should allow for more ways to heaven than just Jesus Christ. Well, that's a wonderful ideology, and I wish it were true. But Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father except through me. Without the death of Jesus Christ, the law of sin condemns me to hell. It condemns you to hell. Without the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, I have no other options. Is that narrow-minded? Perhaps. But when there is only one option, it is the option. I've used this analogy before. If this building burst into flames and all the exits seem blocked by flame and a fireman walks in and says, I came through this opening. All of you must follow me out that opening. Will most of you say, well, you know, that's not my normal door. I think there should be other options. I, I would prefer, I always use the other door. I, I just would prefer to go out that door. 
If that is your only option, it is your only option. Jesus Christ said he was the only option. You cannot practice sin willingly, ignoring the law of death, and say, well, Lord will find another option, another way of doing it. It reminds me of a man that said he was over listening to a phone call from another man. And the man was talking on the phone. He says, I know it's something you want, but I don't think it's a good idea. And the same thing goes for body piercings. I really don't think you need a tattoo. And as long as you're living under my house, I think you should respect my wishes. And the gentleman that was listening to this conversation said, I was secretly cheering him on for his fatherly firmness. And he says, and then the man said, and besides, Mom, you're 75 years old. You don't need a tattoo. <laughs> we want to know what we want to know, and we want to hear what we want to hear. Jesus Christ died on a cross to save us from our sin. Is that a narrow view? Yes, it is. But his resurrection proves that his claim is valid. That he is, in fact, the one and only way to heaven. I would love for there to be thousands of ways to heaven. But the flaw in that is that they are not true. The Bible gives me the law so that I can recognize the sin in my life. Now, I'm here to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to look around and see the sin in somebody else's life. And we do sometimes use the law for that. We go, eh. <laughs> see, that what, see what you just did there? That's against the law, don't you know? And we're real good about pointing out the sin in other people's lives. But the law was designed for me to see the sin in my own life. To desire to not have that sin and to desire to come before God so that I can, in fact, come clean with Him. I will have to, as long as I live, face the law of sin and the law of God. I will not ever be free of my sinful nature. And part of that is a good thing. Because if I were free of my sinful nature, I might somehow presume that I somehow got there. I somehow arrived. I somehow became okay. And that now God will accept me because of how good I am. I need the law of God to understand the grace of God. I deserve death. Simple as that. But even though I deserve death, my God loves me enough that he took that death upon that cross and he says, I will take his sins and I will die for him so that he might have life. My friends, to diminish the law of God is to try and diminish the sacrifice of Christ. We cannot. I need to look at the law and see my sin for as abhorrent as it is for the fact that it separates me from a God that loves me enough to die for me and that I should desire, as Paul did, to rid myself of that sin, even as I understand that, unfortunately, it will always be a part of my natural carnal desires. Sin will always be a part. The law will always be part of your life. And occasionally, if you're like me, you're going to resent that. But understand, I need that law to know how much God loved me and how much he loves everyone around us. So as we look at the law, let us look at it from God's point of view. A God desiring to save us from ourselves rather than a God who wrote arbitrary rules and hammers down as a judge to say, you broke this rule, you broke that rule, you broke this rule. Now his heart is, you are breaking yourself by breaking those laws. You are destroying yourself by breaking those laws. And I love you too much to let you continue breaking those laws. See my law, change your ways. 
And by doing that, we recognize the love of God in a different point of view. And I'll be honest with you, Judy, she comes up with these songs all by herself. And if I could have thought of a perfect hymn to follow this scripture with, I don't think I could have thought of one better than 622. But oh, how you love me is a perfect way 